Um, Actually, another depressing topic, I think, <laughs> probably, um, U.S. And, and North Korea. Um, for the last 15 years or so, I've been involved in a science, academic science engagement project with counterparts in North Korea, academic scientists, computer scientists primarily. We work also with the American Academy for um, uh, um, AAAS uh, for sciences. And I want to just not so much talk about that. I'll give a couple examples. But what I'd like to do is one of my big deals is that empathy really matters for trying to understand conflicts. It's not enough just to watch it and study it, but you sort of have to get a sense of what's going on. I think that's what I like about what Robert and Noble were talking about. They're, they're getting it from the inside. And so I'd like to talk about the, the U.S.-North Korea situation, but from the perspective of what I at least hope I've learned as a consequence of working with North Koreans for the last um, 15 years or so. Um, so let me begin. First of all, um, a famous quote, which certainly applies to the Korean family, I think. All happy families are alike. Um, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, I guess I dissent from one of the claims that was made this morning that um, conflicts are not deeply historical. Um, I came into this thinking, yeah, conflicts are conflicts. But after being involved with this one for a while, my sense is that you really have to wonder whether conflicts are a useful equivalence class for social science theorizing. Um, there are some sweet generous attributes to some conflicts that make it really hard to see how we would generalize across them. And at least in my case, I think sometimes gets in the way of trying to resolve or transform those conflicts from something that's difficult to something that's a little bit easier. Because you don't want to. Conflicts, the details matter, at least in the conflicts I've been involved with, and certainly in this one. And I'll try to convince you of that in a second, um, or at least make it plausible. The metaphor I'm using to kind of get at the idea of an intractable conflict is the, the notion of a Gordian knot, which many of you are probably well aware of, the notion that um, Alexander came in and saw this knot that had been tied by Midas' son um, that was yoking up. But here you can see a. Um, cart, basically. And the notion was whoever, this had been there for hundreds, hundreds of years, the idea was anyone who could untie this knot would rule all of Asia. Um, so Gordius came in, and along with his army, and tried to untie this knot. But it was extremely difficult. The knot had been exposed to the elements. It had a history. The history was getting wet, then drying out, and getting more and more contracted. And if anybody's ever been out in a Syracuse winter with shoelaces and tries to untie them or skating, they know how hard that can be. Now imagine this for centuries. Um, so finally, Alexander said, well, screw this, and just took out his sword and went whap, and cut the, um, the knot. And of course, Alexander went on to rule much of Asia for a while. Um, but the point here is that several things. One, history matters. That knot was hard to untie because of what it had been through. Um, it might not have been as hard to untie at the beginning as it was at the end. Secondly, and my big pitch here is that problems exist within a description. One might argue that hitting that um, knot with a sword doesn't count as untying it. But when you've got a big army behind you, it probably does. And it did in Alexander's case. Um, and that was important because it wasn't just that he wrecked the knot, but that knot had been a big tourist attraction there. So locals were making money off people coming and trying to untie this knot unsuccessfully until Alexander came and cut it, cut it in half. And last, these problems, if you buy the problems exist under a description, descriptions are linguistic. And I buy Wittgenstein's notion that language is public. So I can't just have a private notion of a, pub, of a problem if I'm describing it. It has to be public enough that I can talk to somebody about it. And that's where something that political scientists like me don't like to talk about, but power comes into play. What narratives, what accounts, what descriptions matter for trying to resolve a conflict? Alexander's army was enough to convince people that he, in fact, had untied the knot. But absent that army, probably not. Um, so let me move ahead a little bit now. If I can do with this, boom. Um, I want to give you a little sense. There's no hard, well, I don't think there's a heart shape there. But I want to convince you that this region that we're talking about, the Korean Peninsula up here, really matters. Um, and those numbers represent, at least as of a couple years ago, um, how large those economies were on a global scale. You see numbers like three for Japan, eight for Russia, two for China, 15 for Korea, 190 for um, North Korea. Now that's probably a power imbalance, or at least I would suggest that it is. To put it in a little bit different numbers, here are some of the per capita incomes for the countries in the region. And I put Somalia down there just to give an anchor to those numbers. Um, 
You can see what's going on, and yet if you've been paying attention to the newspapers, you probably know that in this century there have been five nuclear tests, all five of them have been done by North Korea, and I think they've conducted, if you rank countries from having done the most to the least, if that's a good ranking to have, North Korea ranks somewhere like sixth in the world in terms of the number of nuclear explosions or tests that have taken place. So people care about this. Um, now, it's a conflict. I'm arguing it's sort of an intractable conflict. If we're, going to dis if we're going to transform it, we need to somehow or another find out a redescription. If we're going to redescribe that, we have to understand something of the history as to how we got here to this conflict. This is where I'm going next. Um, if you think about the relationship between the United States and North Korea, and that's what I'm focusing on here. The bigger issue is much, very much a multilateral issue, but I want to focus on U.S. North Korea in this talk. Um, these are just examples of the kind of demonization that goes on between the United States and North Korea. The center one is some North Korean um, students pointing things at a picture of George Bush. But similarly, um, U.S. Pardon me? <laughs> anyway, you get the picture. Um, Redescribing things, same thing can matter. Describing them differently can matter. And I want to give you a little experiment to play with here. Um, here are two problems. This one down here and this one over here. Given time constraints, I'll assure you, if unless I copied things wrong, that these are identical problems. But if you had given this problem to a Roman several hundred years ago, years ago they couldn't have done it. The distinction here is between two numbers, which even Plato could think about adding together, and the numerals that represent them. And what I'm talking about with problem descriptions is basically the numeral number distinction here. Um, so this, the Roman numerals here, um, and the things we're more used to, and it's not a simple matter of translation. These numbers, if you learned Roman numerals, and I really didn't because I was gone during fourth grade um, in the United States, but these numbers are not positional. To find out what this number is, you can add these up. You can reverse them. It's the same number. Try that if you're doing arithmetic, at least in a U.S. arithmetic or fourth grade class, you'll get in big trouble if you try to reverse the sequence of the numbers. Moreover, there are no zeros here, no negatives here. There are over there. So we now, in the 21st century, can look at this and from a sort of meta perspective, translate between these two. But if we had been embedded in this at the time, we really couldn't have. Um, at least I don't think we could have until things like zeros were invented. Uh, so, U.S. North Korea. One of my pitches here is that the U.S. views the conflict differently than North Korea views the conflict, and that's made it very difficult to describe or to resolve, to transform. North Korea tends to view relations with the United States in a deeply historical manner where sovereignty, dignity, and I underline dignity here, and security are key issues. For most people, like me anyway, growing up in the U.S., dignity and international relations don't even fit together very much. I know about interests, I know about a lot of things, but dignity, no. But if you work with North Koreans, you'll see that those kind of issues are critical. And I'll try to give you a sense of why. The U.S. tends to view North Korea from a nuclear non or proliferation or non-proliferation perspective. That's what gets the United States government, at least, the attention um, to pay attention to North Korea. Human rights, secondary, but a distant secondary to the nuclear issue. Sec third, I guess third, yeah, here. Um, if you talk to a North Korean, the U.S. matters a lot. North Korean students, um, elementary school students, have more years of required English than do South Korean um, elementary students and elementary school students. And North Koreans are highly literate, 98 percent, I think, by the last census, which was conducted in, along with the United Nations. So we're talking about something that matters here. Um, how many of you speak Korean? <laughs> so you can see the difference here between the centrality. Um, and you still, if, are there any South Koreans here? I guess not. But if you talk to several South Koreans, maybe three or four, I'm sure at least one will have been asked when they meet someone in the United States, are you from North or South Korea? There basically are no North Koreans in the United States because the United States has no diplomatic relations with North Korea and vice versa, and it's almost impossible to see visas coming in of people coming in just randomly walking around from North Korea. So again, if you think back to dignity, but you look at the relationship here, you can see how North Korea sometimes feels they suffer at the hands of these international negotiations. 
And then lastly, which is I think everybody's aware of, there are deep differences with regard to proper forms of governance and rights and roles of individuals in a society. Um, most of us here, certainly I, think North Korea is dramatically on the wrong side of history. As a political scientist, I'm fond of saying North Korea is sort of like Jurassic Park. You can go back and see something that will probably never exist again, but in fact does exist right now. So I hope no one comes across or no one sees me as saying basically being an apologist for North Korea, but I think to transform a conflict, we have to understand it enough to be able to do something to fix it. How many, five? Great, no problem. Um, so let me then quickly go to some uh, methodological issues then I'll race, I hope. Yeah, um, US government is fond of saying we have to deal with the North Korean government not as we wish they were, but as in fact they are. Don Gregg, who is a CIA um, station chief in South Korea, says the longest running failure in the history of American espionage is North Korea. How do we know who they are? Um, and here I want to say a couple things that come from what we talked about this morning collectively. First of all, I am convinced, at least right now, that when we talk about conflict, re conflict and histories of conflict, we have to realize that we live in a highly stochastic world. Probabilities matter. Um, so you can't predict what's going to happen, but you can try to affect at the margin what the probabilities are. A good example of that with North Korea is in 1994, there was an agreed framework agreement between the United States, North Korea, South Korea, Japan. Um, you may remember that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright visited North Korea, brought along a basketball signed by Michael Jordan, which made um, Kim Jong-il very happy. And there was serious talk that President Clinton would visit North Korea and sort of seal the deal, that there would be a comprehensive agreement to get recognition, to get a whole lot of things happening. But if you remember the history of the time, Clinton was distracted by something. Anyone recall what it was? Yeah, um, the Monica Lewinsky affair. Now this has nothing to do with conflict resolution in the sense I understand it, but it was a probable or stochastic, a probabilistic event that got in the way and really changed the future, at least with regard to US and North Korean relations. Uh, what's what? The stochastic? Oh, it just means a, a process that is fundamentally probabilistic. So if you do quantum mechanics, you believe that at least you can calculate the probability that this lectern will jump off the floor. It's very low, measure zero, but it has some probability associated with it. A better example, going to Las Vegas. Um, if you're playing the roulette wheel or something, there are probabilities. You can assign those probabilities and make good decisions, right? So these things sometimes happen. Um, I've got about three minutes, I think, so let me just race through this. Um, I have four cases in the paper. I'm not going to bother you with these here today. But these four cases I use to try to make plausible, if not, um, I guess plausible is the best word, that history does matter to North Koreans in a different way than it does to us. Um, they think that we signed an agreement back in 1905 that basically gave Japan Korea. Japan, as you probably know, came in and took over um, the Korean Peninsula, was a colony of Korea until, of Japan until after World War II. You probably also read in history books that at the end of World War II, two American colonels in 30 minutes using a National Geographic map divided the peninsula at the 38th parallel. Um, no Koreans were involved. Um, we didn't defeat Korea, we defeated Japan then. No Koreans were involved. The, the, the peninsula was divided. A few years later, the Korean War, devastation. Both Seoul and Pyongyang were just basically rubble. And if you think back to those numbers about the state of the economy, what South Korea has done since that time, is absolutely amazing to be somewhere between the 12th and 15th largest economy after being totally destroyed at the end of um, the Korean War. Um, agreed framework, um, this is a, a agreement that was made between the United States, well, I mentioned that already, it was trying to get a comprehensive deal to get rid of um, any kind of a nuclear program on the part of North Korea. It fell apart for reasons which um, I will talk about it at a different time, I guess. Um, this is one picture, though, that I like, this one here, that comes from our science engagement work. Um, and to me, it kind of epitomizes the way in which empathy can play and trust can play a role. This is uh, one, two, three, four, five North Koreans, including somebody from the foreign ministry, um, standing in the Carter Center in front of a picture of Jimmy Carter talking to Kim Il-sung, who is the father, the godfather, the god, really, of North Korea. Um, and this is what I sort of mean by beginning to transform a conflict. These folks 
cannot see, did not see, do not see the relations between the United States. Again, if you live in North Korea and have actually met Kim Il-sung, um, you have very special status. And this was what happened to get some of these things going. Let me jump ahead to a set of policy proposals that I make, and I want to just let you, I want to read these to you just so you can see that this counts as bold from the United States standpoint right now. Each country establish a consular office and the others. In other words, some minimal form of diplomatic relations. Almost certainly not going to happen right now. Why? Two, U.S. T commit to take a lead working with the, through the United Nations to produce a peace agreement permanently ending the Korean War. You talk about dignity, history, and notions of sovereignty. The idea that South and North Korea are still technically at war, North Korea feels itself to be technically in a state of war with us, in, in the United States when I say us, and you wonder why they, why they might feel that they need to develop some kind of a um, defensive system if, if in fact that's what it is. And then another thing that, again, real quick, um, every spring, the United States and South Korea engage in massive what they call military exercises in, North, in South Korea, on the border of North Korea. Um, and it really bothers the North Koreans a lot. They ha it's right at the time that they'd be norm normally harvesting their crops. The sanctions that the United Nations and U.S. put on North Korea heavily limit the amount of fuel and uh, fertilizer that gets into North Korea. They feel they have to get their airplanes up in the air because they think that these war games could easily, or exercises could easily be uh, rouge before they go ahead and attack the North. Um, that is, U.S. and South Korean forces attack the North. Try to get those suspended in return for North Korea suspending or freezing the nuclear development, and then begin to work on ratcheting it back, which I hope um, is something that we could work toward um, in the future. Let me just finish here, and I think I'm almost, maybe I can, okay. This is what we mean by science engagement. This is an example of Peter Augury, who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in, I think, 2003. Um, his fundamental work was actually pretty fascinating. Why is it that, that, you know, our bodies are mostly water, right? Why doesn't it leak out? And this is what Peter got the Nobel Prize for. Why the water stays in us? We can drink water, but it doesn't kind of just leak all out of us at once. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, so he gave, he gave the first non-peace-related Nobel Prize lecture in, in um, North Korea. Okay, I hear it. Um, two, one other thing, track two meetings. Um, this is one of the things that's so important and that involves senior people. This is um, Henry Kissinger on our side, Chae Sun Wee on the North Korean side. She's the chief nuclear negotiator right now with North, um, with, uh, on the part of North Korea. This is the track two meeting. You see John Kerry there. There's Chae Sun Wee and also um, Lee Young Ho, who is the foreign minister of North Korea. So I guess what I want to say is that these kinds of public engagements, in this case academic engagements, bring high-level people together for the scarcest thing that exists right now between the United States and North Korea, given no diplomatic relations, an ability to talk directly to one another in the absence of press, in the absence of a written agreement that they're being coerced to sign. Um, that's better than this, which is, um, for anybody who follows North Korea, knows it's kick the can down the road, which is the typical policy with North Korea. If they do something bad, we try to censor them um, or do something else and then wait until they do something bad again rather than acting proactively. To conclude, I believe we can and must do better. That is, we know enough about conflict resolution, we know enough about conflict transformation, that we need to get this into the heads of the people who are going to be making these kinds of decisions so they do them at least no worse than they're doing now and ideally do them better. Thanks very much.